2016 was a funny year. The results of the American elections and the referendum in the UK were surprising to me, according to the facts. The influence of false information on those results seemed undeniable. But some people said that facts were not so important anymore because we were living in post-truth times and we could consider alternative facts. As I was making a documentary about journalism, I tried to understand how he had arrived at this strange place called post-truth. I always thought that beyond truth, all we would find was a bunch of lies. So I tried to confirm my opinion by contrasting it with the statements collected during my investigation in the United States and Europe. I don't accept the uh, uh, kind of uh, postmodern uh, uh, idea that somehow truth doesn't exist. I think it does. We can try to find it. There are certain levels of truth. There's verifiable truth. That means that what you wrote can be verified. So we need a media that um, is able to filter those lies out, expose them so that we can um, shape our society in the most honorable way that we can. And I also tried to find an explanation to such an incongruous label as post-truth. This is a simple one. The American government lies. The English government lies. The Italian government, the Spanish government, the Russian government, the Spanish, the Chinese, lie, 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 lie. If you're going to remember two words, governments lie. Three, all governments lie. Uh, the government always lies. They may not be lying all the time, but when it's in their interest, they have to lie in order to protect their ability to govern, they think. So if you're dealing with a political figure and a political figure makes a claim, uh, you would be wise to check that out with two or three other people. But simple answers don't explain complex situations, because lies are not new in the world. The strange thing this time was that people voted for the liars because audiences were so poorly informed that they accepted lies as truth. Ese afán por correr, por ser o primeiro, por lanzar o primeiro tweet. O que está facendo é encher a sociedade de ruído e, en realidade, creo que somos a sociedade máis desinformada da historia. Cando temos todos os medios ao nos alcance para, en teoría, estar informados. So let's take a look at what I found about journalism at the start of the 21st century to understand how this confusion and shortfall of information was possible. I was in the offices of a Spanish newspaper when somebody said a plane had just crashed, so I rushed to the internet newsroom area where the internet manager and vice director was organizing his team to cover the story, while at that very same time, readers were browsing the newspaper's website, eager for information. Seeing the rapid flow of information, 
I thought that maybe technology had created a new situation, but journalists still had to look for, order and present the information to the public. Right then, I understood that putting together in the same phrase these two semantic fields, new and journalism, I had to travel further away. Gay Talese loves his profession, which is why he is still actively working. And he vividly remembers his first visit to the newsroom of the New York Times back in 1953. He opens the doors from the reception room into this enormous city room. Hundreds of typewriters, hundreds of editors and writers, and smoking cigarettes and typing and making noise. The machines had bells. In those days, the, the, tele, the, the typewriter had a bell every time. And you hear the bells, you hear the... So many people working for the next day's newspaper, the activity, the atmosphere was exciting. It was like a movie. It was like walking in a big movie set. His memories were not very different from my own experience, even though technology had made newsrooms less noisy. I travel a lot. I meet journalists. They interview me or I visit them or I go into city rooms and magazine offices and I meet them. And I think of them as being part of a nationality that I'm part of. We're like, we're international operators. We have in common our desire to tell the truth. We have in common that power wants to control us. Taking advantage of a feeling of distrust that audiences felt towards journalists, those who said we were living in post-truth times also insisted on telling the people that journalists were dishonest liars. So let's take a look at journalists as a type. Gaetalese himself describes them at the beginning of his book about the New York Times, the kingdom and the power. Most journalists are restless voyeurs who see the warts on the world, the imperfections in people and places. The sane scene that is much of life, the great portion of the planet unmarked by madness, does not lure them like riots and raids crumbling countries and sinking ships, bankers banished to Rio and burning Buddhist nuns. Gloom is their game, the spectacle their passion, normality their nemesis. The description is not indulgent and it partly explains why the social image of journalists is not always positive. However, it is not contradictory to what most of them claim motivated their vocation. I see journalism more as a mission than exactly a profession. Um, it's the oxygen of a democratic society. Oh, I, I just can't imagine having done anything else with my life than being a journalist. We know that in order for democracy to work, citizens have to be informed. They have to know what is being done in their name. They have to know if the two towns over, they're starting to frack in the oil wells and that might affect your drinking water. My grades were always near the bottom of the class, except in one thing. My curiosity was unbounded. My curiosity was intense. It was, it was incessant. People are interesting. And if you're the kind of person who's interested in people, then journalism is a great job for you. I, when journalists come to us, it's generally to complain that they're not being allowed to be the kind of journalist that they want to be. I didn't know what else to do but be a journalist. But newspapers and journalists were suffering a deep crisis that could destroy their entire system. Of course, journalists were worried about the future of their profession and owing to different reasons. The first one was job insecurity. We're looking for 100 uh, people out of a newsroom of about 750, 800 people. So it's not a huge cut, but it's a big cut. You know, The Guardian will still be a huge news organization. It'll still be a huge newsroom. We will still do great journalism. The problem is you can only do that so many times before you start really cutting into the core of what makes The Guardian The Guardian. I think we're seeing uh, the least number of people who can do the job right now. Regardless of the recession, newspapers continue trying to cover all current events as they always had. But the lack of personnel forced the few remaining journalists to multitask in the newsroom, 
which hindered the chances of getting what journalists and their bosses like most, their own information. If they could not send out journalists to get the information, the companies ended up doing the kind of journalism defined by Iñaki Gabilondo. Esto está llevando además al periodismo que está en época de no querer gastar un duro a hacer un periodismo muy fácil llamado el periodismo de espera. Tú te sientas y cada corporación, cada partido, cada institución, cada organización sindical, etcétera, te sirve ya por la mañana eh, el papelito con las cosas que les afectan y tú casi sentado en la mesa sin mover un dedo ni gastar un duro ni en un taxi construyes un relato de la, de la actualidad, pero hecho por otros. ¿no? We know that media outlets are laying off journalists, that the journalists that remain are overworked. Reporters will tell us, for example, well, I used to have to write one story a week and now I have to write a story a day. What does that mean practically? Well, what it means is maybe the journalists can't even get up from their desk to go talk to somebody to get a story. It means they are increasingly reliant on those press releases, those press packages. If you are, you have a deadline of half an hour, you need to do a story, I think it's very difficult to avoid going to that pre-prepared thing that you've got, that's got a quote in it, that's got a name in it, that's got background information in it. It's fed to you to make it easy for you to tell it that way. So what we really require is something countervailing, something on the other side, to, to dig out just that information that that powerful entity, which might be the state or might be a private corporation, that they don't want you to hear, you know, that they don't want you to know about. That's precisely what the journalist has to go for. And that that's why it's such a difficult job and why it is required that you not have an outside influence that is pressuring you so strongly that you are too frightened to tell this story, which is going to make someone unhappy, is going to make someone uncomfortable. So, hidden from the public eye, a huge amount of information was traveling underground from the power centers, fighting to come alive in the media and become independent information. And that is another reason why the reputation of journalists was not always positive, their lack of independence. The audience had the perception that journalists were mere pieces of a mechanism guided by political or economic interests. But maybe the audience was unaware of something that Richard Kaposinski had already pointed out at the end of the 20th century. The world of business discovered that the truth was not important. Not even the political fight was. What was interesting about information was its ability to become entertainment. And once the information entertainment was created, it could be traded. And the more spectacular it was, the more expensive it could become. That's why I went to the MIT in Boston to speak with Noam Chomsky, who explained to me, according to his theoretical perspective, how this process worked. The media are, if you think about them from a kind of a structural point of view, uh, the major media, say New York Times, Washington Post, uh, CBS News, privately owned major corporations, uh, which uh, sell a product to a market like other businesses. The market is advertisers. That's where their income comes from, not from subscriptions. Uh, the product that they're selling is audiences. At the beginning of the 21st century, the information entertainment, already known as infotainment, had completely surrounded us all. But it was not confined to the mass media. It came from our own pockets and was hanging on the walls. But apparently, we were delighted to be pursued at any time, and we would enslave ourselves to information through social networks. Journalists were not to blame for it, neither were the big corporations. The blame was on us, on our natural tendency to allow our dreams to seduce ourselves.
a real understanding of the world requires some digging and some depth and a, a real story of an event needs to have some historical context and some social context and a range of views and you're just not getting that from a place that's just playing you a clip downloaded from a TV show in another country and then a few three sentences under it saying isn't this neat look at this you know this is entertainment this is not news one of the consequences is just what you described the effort to uh, reduce capacity for independent thought and independent action by diverting people, giving them a limited amount of awareness of what the world is like, but to try to prevent uh, serious understanding or uh, a critical uh, analysis. The question is, how can journalists do their job so fast and still do it properly? The answer is they can't. The reporters now have to stop every 30 or 45 minutes and update the story that they filed an hour ago because it has to be updated for the web. That means someone covering a congressional committee doesn't really have time to do anything but run into the committee, hear two committee members talk, and then run out and update the story. Knitting all that together in a way that makes sense and is documented is virtually impossible. That's why I say that the pressure of quick reaction time, get it up, get it up fast, is reducing the ability of the journalists who are trying to document the information to actually do their job. So, let's state the truth. Good journalism needs time. That is something they know well at the New York Times. To my mind, the New York Times has done this, is the model. So the New York Times has cut and cut and cut and cut, but not in the newsroom. The New York Times has very deliberately protected the newsroom, knowing that that's why the New York Times exists, and that's why people pay for it. Walking through the streets of Manhattan, anyone could see that nail salons were everywhere. But Sarah Maslin Nier saw something else. Well, what was really interesting about the nail salon story is that every single person involved in it, every source, had no reason to speak with me. People in my story are undocumented immigrants working illegally in this country, terrified of being discovered, and yet they spoke. I did approach 400 and ended up interviewing about 125. My investigation took 13 months. I just focus on this story. The only thing is occasionally there would be some really big news story and they'd say, everybody, all hands on deck, drop it for a day, Sarah. But no, I worked exclusively on this story. My meetings with them, sometimes we talk about nothing, especially in the beginning. We would sit down and talk about their lives and have coffee. And even when I heard something really compelling, I would prevent myself from asking about it. I, uh, I had that approach with all these people and developed a level of comfort and rapport with them that eventually they wanted to tell their story. My story, yes, it took 13 months, but it had a magnificent payoff. The Times investment made laws change. The governor changed the law after my story came out and made lives change. So I don't think the Times is willing to shortchange stories or journalism, no matter what the economic climate is. Before we move on, let me say something else. I don't think journalists are the enemy of the people. The enemy doesn't try to inform. The enemy tries to mislead and to cheat in order to gain an advantage. But how is it possible to cheat the audience with the enormous amount of information currently flowing around the globe? To answer this question, we have to think about the media. He's the founder of ISIS. He's the founder of ISIS, okay? He's the founder. Already in the 20th century, the media had evolved into a type of competition which, instead of fighting for the description of the world they offered by looking for different points of view about reality, would compete in order to offer their audience what they knew their competitors were going to publish, in such a way that everyone started to leave en masse, focusing like beehives, attracted by the unstoppable call of current events. That is how one item of news would grow more than the rest, even managing to eclipse all others. 
Once the party was over, the media would pick up their equipment and would march on to their next location in a disciplined fashion. This behavior could be found suspicious. If all of the big media outlets tended to choose the same items of news and treat them in a similar manner, were they doing it so as not to fall behind their competition? Or in order to allow financial conglomerates to build a social consensus favorable to their unlimited development? Look at how awful the Wall Street coverage is, how Wall Street bankers, who are little more than thieves, got away with all these kind of criminal acts, which they don't ever get punished for. The journalism is terrible. Manufacturer consent, which I've used, I didn't invent. It's a, a term invented by the one of the leading, maybe the leading public intellectual in the United States in the 20th century, Walter Lippmann. He described uh, manufacturing consent as a new art in the practice of democracy. He regarded it as a good thing for democracy. Now, the idea was to ensure that the mass of the public, uh, who they regarded with considerable contempt, uh, would not be misled by uh, erroneous uh, ideas. Uh, they, these, these are what they call uh, ignorant, and the public are ignorant and meddlesome outsiders who have to be put in their place and uh, it's the intelligent minority who have to make the decisions. There are hundreds of channels, uh, television, radio, on the internet. Um, but we often get the chorus of the same voices. And what we need is that true diversity of voices. I think it has to be more about fairness and more about fairness to the range of perspectives and people that exist. And when those voices are there, not your typical pundits that you get on all the networks. You know, it seems to be you may have a number of networks, they're all interviewing the same people. The small circle of know-nothing pundits, of pundits who know so little about so much. If journalists were able to achieve the highest goals of their profession, and the, they were freed from the institutional constraints, they'd be presenting right in front of the, uh, the easy of access, the most important information. If you're talking about issues of war and peace, most people deeply care. If you're talking about climate change, the fate of the planet, people care. The growing inequality between rich and poor, people care. Independence just means that you are willing to tell the truth and let the chips fall where they may, and you don't have to keep looking over your shoulder because, say, your owner or your boss or your sponsor has lines that they don't want you to cross. It really has a lot to do with your freedom to say things that other people don't want to hear. I mean, I think the media reflects the establishment consensus. Um, it represents power instead of challenging power. The liars took advantage of this situation by pretending to offer an alternative point of view, contrary to the establishment represented by the corporate media, sending their messages directly to the public. Thus, they could skip the filter of professional journalists trained in detecting lies by using the social media. At that time, news wouldn't just travel on the newspaper's websites, but would constantly bounce off news aggregators and social networking sites. El problema en ese sentido hoy para los periodistas te diría que la gente no discrimina. Hoy todo se mezcla y además se mezcla en un, en un bundle, en, en, en un paquete en el que la gente va saltando de unas cosas a otras. ¿no? El mayor ejemplo de eso es el, es el, es el newsfeed de, de, de Facebook, ¿no? ese timeline donde uno se va encontrando desde las fotos de su perro hasta las no, los, los comentarios de sus amigos o de su familia, con noticias, con entretenimiento, etc. I think a lot of journalists dismiss BuzzFeed because they say, well, it's fluffy content, and that's, all, that's you know, and they conflate fluffy content with shareability. And I just don't think that's actually right. This is why Facebook, for example, is making such a huge investment in instant articles and doing so many partnerships with serious news organizations. That's the same reason that Snapchat is making is doing ser partnerships with serious news organizations. It's because they know that quality content travels well as on, on those platforms as well. 
Así como en las inundaciones, lo primero que escasea es el agua potable. En las inundaciones informativas, como consecuencia de la gran cantidad de señales que llegan de todos los, de todos los medios, la proliferación de medios, a través de Internet, desde cualquier lugar de la Tierra, esa inundación de señales, lo que hace más difícil es identificar la información potable. Porque naturalmente, ya sabemos todos, que una vez descubierto el poder de esta inundación de señales, todos los grandes poderes del mundo se han organizado para tener metidas ahí sus fuentes de, de, de agua tóxica. So, besides adapting themselves to the new ways of exercising their profession, journalists still had to look for stories and write them up, which left them with two options. They could either wait and recycle information sent by press offices, or go out into the world and leave no stone unturned in order to find it. A conocer la ciudad, con, hablar con los personajes, con la gente que trabaja, que es la ciudad, básicamente. Es, es para mí la ciudad es la gente que la habita. Todos los días estamos buscando historias para contar y para y para y para reportear. Te pongo el micrófono acá, ahí. Ok. Te voy a empezar a grabar. ¿Cómo hacen ustedes para que la gente se acerque? The problem with investigative journalism in a world controlled by statistics and executives worried about numbers was the difficulty in measuring the productivity of a journalist's information. I think a lot of times journalists conflate the number of clicks a story gets with impact and resonance. And I think that is a mistake. We're applying metrics that were actually designed to measure the success of advertisements to measure the success of journalism, and that's a problem. Driving people to a story is job number one, and it almost doesn't matter what they see when they get there. I think this is extremely troubling. If you say the top 10 best something, people want to look at that. It seems like it's a comprehensive. People like lists. People like short items. Um, but that's not what we need, and there's a difference between the kind of news coverage or just entertainment coverage, short stories, light items that you might enjoy reading, and the kind of stories that you really need to know in order to make an informed decision about, you know, who to vote for or what's happening in your, in your community. Naturally, not all types of information needed to undergo the same type of processing. But the crucial element in obtaining any type of information has always been, and will continue to be, obtaining reliable sources capable of providing relevant data. Reporters are just very good at sort of finding the discontents within organizations and sort of drawing them out and getting them to talk off the record sometimes. The way I do it is I approach them and tell them very openly that I am very curious about them, and I explain why. You have to go to the cop bar, um, and that's how you develop policing sources. You don't do it by, you know, coming to their office and demanding to meet with them. People who want a story told, perhaps a whistleblower, someone who feels very strongly about something, goes to media they trust, which is why it's so important to be trustworthy to not stand there protecting those in power, but have a tradition of holding those in power accountable. Sometimes, sources would only agree to provide information under the condition that their name was never mentioned. These were known as anonymous sources and were at the center of great controversies. One of the reasons I left reporting and agreed to become an editor was that uh, I was reporting in Washington. In order to get the information you needed from a source who knew the information, 
you had to agree to protect them, a source said, an anonymous source story. And that bothered me. I just had trouble doing that. If that source had a name, they could be accountable. You know, the reason you put names on sources is that it, when they lie to you, you want to know who it was who lied to you so that you don't go to them again. If you allow them anonymity, then they can lie to you forever. I have no secrets with my reader. I insist when I talk to someone for the record that they use their name. And if they don't use their name, I don't want to hear them. I don't care. Whatever they're telling me, if they don't have their name on it, I can do without it. The abuse of anonymous sources has another dire consequence. The audience gets used to receiving information that is not supported by facts, and thus information is confused with opinion. And what happens when people don't need facts to corroborate information and only get informed by sharing content with groups based on similarity? They can believe either the facts or the lies they share. All of us will always find power a fascinating force. Power is attractive and tempting. And of course, journalists are not alien to humankind's natural tendency. Reporting is the gathering of factual information. The writing is taking that factual information that you've gathered and shaping it and putting it into phrases, using words that make a picture for the reader. Reunir datos siempre lleva mucho tiempo y, y nunca le das el tiempo que haría falta. Pero, obviamente tienes unos plazos, hay límites. My eyes are the first thing. I visualize a story. I see people that are going to represent my story. La cuestión es cómo presentas, cómo ordenas, cómo decides lo que das y lo que no das, porque no cabe todo. And then I have to interview him and get the facts right. A veces hay cosas obvias, ¿verdad? sí, empiezas por lo importante, de acuerdo. Pero luego, ¿cómo fluye el asunto? Then the real part of the work is what's your first sentence. What is the first words of the first sentence? How, after you write a sentence, you rewrite it? And how do you improve it? How do you improve it? You change some words, or you eliminate some words, or you try with that first sentence, and then with the second sentence, and then with the third sentence, to write a paragraph that is the lead of the story. And that first paragraph has to be so compelling, so visual, so interesting that the reader is going to read the second paragraph, and then the third paragraph, and the fourth paragraph, read the whole story. ¿Cómo puedo presentárselo a, al lector o a, a, al público eh, de la forma más honesta posible? And you still could be a storyteller, but you can tell the story truthfully and using information that's verifiable, that people can check and make sure that you didn't exaggerate for the simple matter of making a better story or more readable story. If you take enough time, you dig deeply enough, you can find enough information that's compelling, that's interesting, that is the material of storytelling, and then you write as a storyteller, a journalist as a storyteller. That's what I've always tried to do, to the best of my ability, to tell a story. Traditionally, newspapers, radio and television would display political surnames that would identify their position and their point of view. I mean, the thing that, that shapes a magazine's character is the types of questions you ask. Eso no puede transformar la información en propaganda. Eso no puede hacer que se degrade la información 
tienes que tener una posición, pero con argumentos, fundada en hechos, y tienes que hacer información que presente eh, todos los elementos de la noticia para que el juicio al final lo tenga el lector. The journalist always has to guard against uh, the natural bias that works its way into everything we do. We're, we're, we're human beings, and human beings react to the world in a personal way. Uh, that's a built-in bias. The point of view also determines the relevance of the information and, therefore, what is worthy of being published and what isn't. But some information, most of which we are interested in finding out, tends to be unpleasant for someone powerful. That's why power is usually the most interested party in domesticating information, and journalists feel the pressure to keep certain things quiet. No, a mí las presiones no me dan miedo, que las sufro todos los días, pero eso va en el cargo, ¿no? Ya sabes que vas a tener eh, 20 llamadas de diferentes sitios diciéndote que esto no lo publicas. News should be what powerful people don't want you to know, because after all, powerful people have press offices, they have ways to get out their story, they have ways to get out the information that they want you to hear. Cada vez que publicas una información o cada vez que... Eh, tus periodistas están investigando un tema, pues eh, si es de un tema político te llaman los afectados, si es de un tema de gobierno te llaman desde el gobierno, si es de una empresa o de un banco te llaman. Some journalists assured me that they can work with total freedom, without any sort of influence from the board of directors on their work. I'm not going to answer that question. I don't think the New York Times has a bias. In... Of course, there's a bias. But that doesn't mean you can't have good stories. She was dealing with the oppressed victims, who were these women, working under terrible management standards, being underpaid and overworked. Okay, that's good. But using that same kind of formula, use it on power and see how far you get. I have many friends who are really fine, outstanding journalists, and uh, uh, they can describe to you the constraints that they're under. Well, they're mostly very well aware of the institutional constraints that uh, shape and control and uh, uh, affect the kind of work that can be produced. But pressure, just like most of the ways of corruption, would grow along with the subtlety of reality and wouldn't normally be exercised in a direct way. Nobody ever says, don't do that story because we have an advertiser that will be very angry about that or because our corporate owner doesn't like that kind of story. That's not what they hear. What they hear is, hmm, you know, that's not really very sexy, you know, or that's going to take a lot of resources or that's going to take too much time and wouldn't you rather do this other thing? It's something that at the end of the day, one absorbs it, one absorbs it internalizing it y acaba teniendo esas limitaciones seguramente inconscientemente. You only need to see one reporter fired, you know, for getting the right wrong person angry to internalize that idea and to realize that's not something you want to do. Amidst the panic provoked by the difficulties in finding a new business model that would result profitable, besides the political power, economic powers could also pressurize the mass media by threatening to take their advertising campaigns elsewhere if certain information were to be made public. CBS had done a wonderful series by a reporter named Roberta Baskin. They'd done a series on sweatshops by Nike, Nike sweatshops. And it was a great series. It exposed a lot of hardship and unfairness, and it was really hard-hitting, and it won awards. So Roberta Baskin went back to do uh, an update on the Nike sweatshop story. But in the meantime, CBS had signed a sponsorship deal with Nike. And so CBS was running Nike ads. And in fact, CBS anchors were wearing Nike clothes on the air. Now, Roberta Baskin is told, no, her Nike sweatshop story is not newsworthy, is not interesting, and she's not going to be able to do it. It's obvious that the powerful complain about journalists when journalists uncover their lies and put their privileges in danger. The truth is that 
even though we find power fascinating, we also value freedom and democracy. We expect to be able to revoke our rulers, or at least to believe that such a thing is possible. At the beginning of the 21st century, the population still needed accurate information. And they were actively looking for politicians who knew how to respond to the shifting challenges that the technological and social evolution was constantly demanding. But since the people would exercise their right to vote in a more emotional rather than critical way, the political scientists from the political parties would design campaigns in a more theatrical way I would observe political rallies and feel that journalists were the most critical among the attendees. Elections are being decided by people who no longer have a core of factual information about the candidates and the positions they're taking and the arguments they're making. If you watch the campaigns, it's all about who looks good, who acts good, who presents their words well, not about the content, I believe. It's this disruption of the information flow that has led directly to the disruption of the ability to govern in this country. After talking to many journalists and visiting many media outlets in several countries, I still wondered what the media were going to be like in the future. Are still kind of locked in this mentality that what we're creating is a newspaper in digital form, and I think that is a fundamental problem. I don't even know what a newspaper website means to normal people. Not to journalists. We know what that means. It's a newspaper website, but you know, normal people don't think about newspaper websites. They think about news. There are all kinds of things we could do to improve how we tell stories, to make those stories more relevant. We should be thinking about how to tell stories on mobile. What are the needs of readers, of news consumers on mobile? What are the needs of consumers on desktop? What are the needs of consumers at different times of the day? I would ask myself whether they would choose independence over power, as Catherine Graham had done while in charge of the Washington Post, when she revealed the Watergate scandal, or whether they would rather choose to tread along the more comfortable paths in order to bypass the financial crisis afflicting the media. I think there are examples of organizations that are oriented around, around different sorts of paradigms. So BuzzFeed is one of them. 13 ways you know you're from the Midwest, and everyone from the Midwest would share that. Whether you think BuzzFeed is amazing or whether you think it is you know, the end of the world as we know it, is not the point. Once they developed that, they sort of founded a news arm of BuzzFeed that employs a number of investigative journalists, including a Pulitzer Prize winner, um, very experienced people, but also a lot of young people who are just talented reporters. Um, and so they package those writers' material in the sort of shareable, clickable way that they learned from marketing this easier content. The point is that the organization is entirely designed to be consumed on other platforms, right? All of the content that BuzzFeed creates is designed to be consumed on Facebook, to be consumed on Twitter, to be consumed on other platforms. You travel via shares, not 
via some sort of broadcast mechanism. Instead of that, we're still in this very broadcast mentality of like, we speak, you listen. BuzzFeed has organized itself around a particular distribution strategy that newsrooms like this one just simply don't understand and are not investing in to understand. And if we don't understand, and that's just one example, but if we don't understand this, and we don't reorient around how people are consuming content now and will in the future, I mean, we're dead. I would also ask myself whether the population had the time to worry about their right to information. I would also worry whether we would be willing to do something else, aside from charging our smartphones, to be able to follow the frenetic exchange of information, mainly commercial, partisan, or trivial. The idea of uh, people, especially young people, uh, kind of obsessed with extremely superficial uh, interactions with others on a little device that they hold in their hand while they're walking around is not a healthy thing, I believe. Much of that information was precisely fake news, lies that attempted to cheat the audience, to disguise the words of hawks as those of doves. But if the journalism that survived were the one that paid more attention to consumer preferences than to their right to be informed, we would be running the risk of reducing their condition of sovereign citizens to subject consumers. In fact, during the US presidential campaign, Fake news was widely shared on social networks as if it were real news. It was terrifying to think that the simplification of messages could win the battle of audiences, while verifying the reputation of news and media could become secondary, in such a way that toxic information could be consumed as a drinkable truth. Corrupt. It's such a nasty one. I would wonder whether we really wanted to know the truth or would we prefer a pretty story? Maybe we would settle by simply voting and letting others take all the decisions as proposed by Walter Lippmann. The basic tenets of good journalism remain the same. Allowing people to describe their own experience as Bill Kovach and Tim Rosentiel say in their book, Blur, democracy stakes everything on a continuing dialogue of informed citizens. And that dialogue rises or falls on whether the discussion is based on propaganda and deceit or on facts and verification pursued with a mind willing to learn. Ultimately, it was evident that the public's right to information would continue to exist and would have to be exercised by specialized professional staff. Journalism had always cost and would continue to cost a lot of money. Journalism of verification requires people who are allowed to devote all of their time to verifying information that's important to go into the news report. That requires money. Journalism takes effort, and journalism requires funding, and journalism requires time to get it right and to extract the truth. It seemed to me that if the population wanted their right to be respected, they would have to exercise their responsibility by contributing to the funding of independent information. The media were starting to fight against the idea that, on the internet, the traffic of certain articles susceptible of being transmitted digitally in their totality had to be free by definition. While I was shooting this film, new things were being tested. Paywalls, subscriptions, and even donations. What seemed undeniable was that if the public were not willing to finance access to the information they consumed, 
Those who did would have the possibility to decide about what and in which way the public was to be informed. And maybe in those media of the future, our voices would not be heard, but those of some automatons ready to replicate us. No, Mr. President-elect, Go Mr. President-elect, Go since you are attacking no, our news not organization, you, not can you. you give us a chance? Your organization you're, you're is attacking our I believe that those who want to live in post-truth times try to seize the moment to eliminate the so-called fourth power by convincing people not to trust journalists. They do so because journalists are trained to verify facts and they are not so easy to hoodwink as untrained people. To finish off the conversation with Gator Elise, I asked him what was wrong with journalism. OK, I'm done for the day. Hector? What's wrong with journalism is the wrong journalists. It's not journalism. It's the people who don't know how to be great journalists. They don't know how to be... They don't have pride in what they do. They're just mediocre people. Now, you find mediocre people who are in politics. You find mediocre people who are in banking. You find mediocre people who are in every calling in life. Journalism is made up of good and bad, just like the police department, just like the, 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 the priesthood. OK. Not all journalists would do their job correctly. And that is why they would receive criticism from the citizens. But I'm afraid that if we skip the filter of journalism to verify facts, and we accept post-truth times without asking questions, what would be at stake is not only our ability to vote properly, but the chance to vote at all.